All right. Well, let me uh, read for us now the, um, the birth of our Lord Jesus from uh, Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And may the Lord bless these words and again remind us of just how uh, wonderful this event was and is. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord." This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Oh, may the Lord bless uh, again his word to our hearing tonight. Now, this morning, remember, we saw uh, a few things. We saw uh, who Jesus is, that he is, uh, you know, the Lord, our salvation, uh, the covenant God of Israel, the one who became man. We saw what he came to do, and essentially it's wrapped up in his name, as I've said before, Yahweh, the Lord of salvation. He came to save us from our sins. And we realized that he was the only one who could do this. He had to be God and man because we owed the debt, and the debt was so great only God could pay it. But I think we saw most importantly that he actually did pay that debt for us that he didn't come simply to make salvation possible. He came actually to save us. He will save his people from their, their sins. And that, as a matter of fact, is what he has done. Now this, among other things, is what the angel told Joseph so that he wouldn't be afraid to take Mary as his wife. As we come to our passage this evening, Luke has told us other things that have happened Remember the Lord sent his angel to Zacharias to tell him that he and his wife would have a son whose name would be John. He sent an angel to tell Mary that she had been chosen to bear the Messiah. We read that passage this morning. Mary visited Elizabeth. And when John, who was still in the womb, heard uh, the voice of her greeting, he leapt for joy in the presence of Jesus. And at that point, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and told Mary how blessed she was because the Lord had chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah. At this point, John has already been born. Remember, he was conceived six months before Jesus. And at that birth, Zacharias' tongue was loosed and he began to prophesy that this child who had been born would go before the Messiah to prepare his way, to prepare God's people to receive him. Now tonight, we're going to look at the next four things that happen. The census that brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, 
the birth of our Lord Jesus, the angel's announcement to the shepherds, and the shepherd's trip to Bethlehem to find uh, the Savior. So first, we see the Lord use the census to bring Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Luke tells us that Caesar Augustus ordered that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And what he meant by that, of course, was the Roman Empire. That was the world in those days. And the reason he ordered this census was he wanted the people counted in each province so that they would know how much tax needed to be collected, how much they owed to Rome. Now, the number wasn't actually based upon how many lived in those particular regions, but rather whether your family originated there and how many of your family members actually belonged to that particular area. Now Luke tells us that this was the first census that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now I think that that was important to note because in those days that's how events were actually located in, in history. Um, either how far it was from an important event or whose reign it was during. Uh, this is how it's remembered. This is, again, we have the, uh, the calendar. We use B.C. and A.D. to locate events, but in those days we know it was located by uh, prominent figures. And here are two prominent figures that Luke mentions. Now, this shows us that Luke is presenting this as, as history as an event that really took place, not as a fairy tale and not as a myth. I mean, you'll notice, again, this is how we tell what the, the genre is of, of the literature that we're reading. You, know, you pick up uh, Aesop's fables and you read Once Upon a Time and you know that uh, what's going to follow, of course, isn't true, but it's something that's made up. Well, Luke doesn't say this happened once upon a time. He tells us exactly when this happened. And this also reminds us that it's not simply a, a legend um, or, you know, the embellishment of a story that people who are religious simply choose to believe. You know, that's what the, um, well, the skeptics, the secularists, the atheists who study the Bible believe what the Bible's about. They believe that perhaps a person named Jesus actually lived, but his whole life was embellished. Well, this, this isn't like that. And it's not like the Book of Mormon, which uh, the Mormons believe is, is true, that it's actually inspired and given by God. But it's full of people and places that had never been found, that as far as we know never existed, and yet they continued to believe in it. Well, Luke gives to us actual personages and tells us about events, and he pinpoints it in time to tell us this event took place in real time and space history. We know from, um, from history, from archaeology, that Quirinius held this office in Syria from 4 BC to 12 AD. And we know that Caesar Augustus reigned from 27 BC to 14 AD and how their reigns essentially in, uh, overlapped. Well, Jesus was born in about 3 BC. And notice that this was the first census that Quirinius took, and he held office from 4 B.C. to 12. So just roughly maybe less than a year from the time he took office, the census had been taken. Now, because of the census, everyone had to go to their own city to register. And Joseph and Mary, because they were both of the family of David, went to Bethlehem in Judea, the city of David, and Mary was with child. Now, Caesar Augustus ordered the census because of taxes, but we know the Lord ordered it in order that he might fulfill his word through the prophet Micah. Again, as we read in our meditation, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity." The Lord is basically uh, has brought about that uh, out of Bethlehem, and you know that Bethlehem literally, again, not only the names of people, but also the names of places have meaning in Hebrew. They're not just bare words uh, uh, that uh, perhaps don't have any other meaning except the place they designate. Bethlehem means the house of bread. 
And so the Lord is saying that out of the house of bread would come bread, which if one eats of it, will give him life. The bread that comes down out of heaven that gives life to the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we know, Bethlehem is also the city of David. And from the city of David would come one of his descendants who would be qualified to rule over Israel and not just over Israel, but over the world. Now, perhaps to Joseph and Mary, this, this census may have seemed like a random event uh, that Caesar Augustus just happened to um, call for the census, although I'm sure they had some understanding of God's sovereignty and His providence as it rules over all things. It was certainly a part of His plan. And sometimes things like this, you know, happen. Maybe sometimes it may seem as though things are happening around us randomly and disconnected. But we need to understand that the Lord is the one who is controlling all the circumstances and all the situations that we find ourselves in and that He is using them for His good purposes. He doesn't do it just in the great events of redemption, but He does it even in the minutia, even in the small details of our lives. And He is using the things that are ongoing in our lives for good purposes. And that would be to sanctify us, to get us ready for heaven, and of course, to promote His kingdom, which is what we've seen Him doing here. Now, if we believe that, then as we see things happening that we don't particularly care for, if we believe the Lord is sovereign and we trust Him, we're reminded that we really never need to be afraid of anything because everything is happening exactly as He intends. So. Again, first we see the census. Secondly, we see the birth of our Lord Jesus. Now that the Lord had them in the right place, the time came for Mary to give birth, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, last week we saw that being firstborn, remember, makes someone special. It makes them holy. And this basically singled out that Jesus was special. Luke writes, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. We saw that to be holy means that, we, that, well, that one belongs to the Lord. When the Lord struck down the firstborn of Egypt, He claimed the firstborn of the sons of Israel. And then He later took the tribe of Levi and set them apart to be holy to serve Him in the tabernacle and the temple. Jesus is holy because He's firstborn. He's holy because of who He is. He is the Son of God. He's holy morally because He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin. And as we saw, that that meant not only that this child would be the Son of God, but that He would be sanctified, which means that He loves righteousness and He hates sin. And He is holy because of the work that the Lord set Him apart to do which is to make us holy. Jesus, this Holy One, came into the world to separate us from the world to God and to separate us from sin by His Holy Spirit that we might serve Him in holiness. And let, you know, let's remember what a great blessing that is. If it wasn't for the Lord's work, we would still be desiring sin, following after sin, and even though we still struggle with it today, we would be slaves to sin but we have been set free to be able to do that which is truly good and truly honoring to the Lord and good for one another and for our neighbor. The Lord has given us the power to do that because He sent Jesus into the world. Now, after He was born, Mary wrapped Him in clean cloths, and a commentator points out, I believe it was Matthew Henry, that this shows how, how poor they were that she didn't have anyone there to help her do that, that she had to do that by herself. Uh, the way that we, of course, um, take care of those who, who have children, we don't expect them really to do anything, but just simply to lay there and recover. We have people to serve us when, when we give birth to children, when our, our wives, uh, when mothers give birth to children, but not in this case. Too poor to really have any help. You know, the Lord tells us that He chooses the poor, to make them spiritually rich. And one of the things that shaped and molded Mary's life was the fact that she was not 
basically the, the daughter of, of a king. She wasn't the daughter of some wealthy aristocrat, so to speak, but she was uh, out from a poor family. And the, through that poverty, the Lord shaped her character. It's those who are needy, those who are needy who are dependent upon the Lord, which is why the Bible says that He has chosen the poor to make them rich in faith. The needy are those who place their hope in God. And more often, well, very often, not always, for more than just their food, but they look to the Lord for everything. So after she wrapped him, then she laid him in a manger. Remember, the census had brought many people from out of town. The inns, which were not numerous, were, were filled before they arrived. So they had to stay in a barn, essentially. They had to stay in a cattle, or in a, in a barn or a cattle stall, where there was a feeding trough, which is what a manger is. And that served as his first crib. So again, we're reminded what, what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, that the one who was infinitely rich beyond measure for our sake became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. Now third, we see the angelic announcement uh, to the shepherds. Luke tells us that in that region there were some shepherds watching over their sheep now, I'm sorry to have to say this, I have said it before on numerous occasions, and perhaps you're already aware of this, but the fact that the shepherds were out there watching their sheep essentially means that he was not born in December. Uh, flocks were pastured in the open fields from the time of Passover, which, was in, which is in April, until autumn, which begins in September. So Basically, April through September is where we would find shepherds doing what they're doing here, but we wouldn't find them doing this in December, and that means that Jesus' birth didn't take place in December. Rather, it took place within this time frame. Now, Hippolytus of Rome, who lived from 170 to 235, was actually the first one who came up with the December 25th date. And I was trying to get some sense of how he arrived at that because there really isn't any you know, seasonal things going on here that uh, would, would tell us. And somehow he calculated when Jesus died and then he backed up a year and then he, he said, well, a year earlier than that uh, on the calendar, uh, certainly it would be, um, have to be more than a year, it'd have to be uh, something like the, the 33 and a half years. But then he projected nine months, four, actually took nine months from the birth to the death, to the birth, backed up nine more months and somehow came up with December the 25th. Anyway, uh, how he determined the, the, uh, that, t that that would be the way to do it, I, I really don't know. But Chrysostom, who lived from 347 to 407, agreed. And so that date has been accepted by the church since that time. But it doesn't appear as though that really is correct. But let's not forget, it's not the date that matters but the, the fact that he was born, that's really what makes a difference here. Well, while the shepherds were guarding, while they were caring for their sheep, while they were watching over them, an angel suddenly appears, and the glory of the Lord lights up the area around them. And like Zacharias, who saw the angel in the temple and immediately was terrified, they also were terribly frightened. But the angel, knowing their fear, Again, immediately comforted them as he did Zacharias. Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, the angel wasn't bringing a message of judgment. The angel was bringing good news. Today, the Savior of all mankind, not, not each and every individual, as we saw this morning, but all kinds of people, not just Jews, but also Gentiles, has been born for you, Christ the Lord. And the angel also told them how they could know that what they said or what he said was true. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, we know that finding a baby wrapped in cloths wouldn't be so unusual. But lying in a feeding trough, uh, that would be unusual. And that's likely why the Lord allowed the inns to uh, fill up, maybe why uh, Joseph and Mary, as they began their trip, maybe got a late start and they didn't get there early enough to, to get a place in the inn, why the Lord planned that they would be where they were. 
But the angel also gave them one more sign. I should say the Lord gave the sign to them. Heaven opened up. And a multitude of angels appeared, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now again, is this peace for everyone, peace for the entire world? Perhaps. Perhaps the, the Lord is intending, as we know, as we look at differing views of, of end times and what's going to happen. Perhaps the kingdom is going to bring peace eventually among all mankind. Certainly it will when the Lord finally returns. He'll bring about ultimate peace, won't he? Or does the Lord mean instead here that he is bringing peace among men with whom the Lord is pleased? Peace between God and man. Peace between the Lord and his people, those whom Jesus is coming to save. But they saw these holy angels, they saw God's servants, those who love to see what the Lord is doing, those who love to watch His plan unfolding, glorifying God for the fulfillment of His promise to send His Son into the world that He might bring peace between God and man. You know, these angels, it's interesting, the Bible does say that they're, they're, they're not only created, to, uh, to serve those who will inherit salvation. But they, they rejoice in what the Lord is doing. They, uh, they're actually rooting for us in a certain sense in heaven. And when they see the Lord uh, per, you know, just moving ahead in His plan, it, it thrills them. Well, it should, of course, thrill us as well, particularly because it has to do with us. The Lord did not redeem the angels. Those that fell will forever remain fallen, but he has redeemed fallen mankind. He has redeemed us. Jesus is our peace. He has brought peace between us and God. He is the end of our warfare with God, and now we belong to him. Now, finally, we see the shepherds go to Bethlehem to find the child. Once the angels had gone back into heaven, uh, the shepherds left for Bethlehem to find this Savior, now, we might think that that was a difficult task to do, I mean, trying to find somebody in, in this town, but we need to remember that Bethlehem was not very large. As a matter of fact, cities we think are large in those days were actually quite small. William Albright, the famous archaeologist, estimates that at the time of Jesus' birth, there were only about 300 people that lived in that town and around that town. The census may have brought perhaps a couple hundred more people. And... Everything okay? Okay. But that also means there weren't that many stables in the area. And so if the angel told the, the shepherds that Jesus was in a manger, then they would know exactly where to look, and it wouldn't be really that hard to find him. So they went looking for the child, and when they found him, they saw him in the feeding trough, as the angel said, and they knew that this was him. So then they told Joseph and Mary what the angel had said. And when they heard it, they were amazed. Now, this is really, again, how we should respond uh, to what the Lord has shown us as well. Uh, and that we should respond as the, as the shepherds actually did when they heard this good news. They went and they shared it with those around them so that they too might know what the Lord had revealed to them. Now, we've already said the angels love this. You know, the angels would love to have our particular job. They love to serve the Lord. They love to be bearers of good news. And that's something that we should have in ourselves as well. You know, the Lord has given to us good news, and we should be excited about it, and we should love to share it, not only because of the good that it will do, at least we hope, to those we share it with, at least the potential good, but also because that is what our Lord, whom we love, desires us to do. Now, when Mary heard what they had to say, the Bible says that she treasured it up in her heart, which means that she held on to it. She remembered it. She meditated on it, pondered in her heart, what do these things mean? Now, it isn't, I think, that she didn't understand what the shepherds had told her, who this one was and what the angels had said, or what the angel had told her, 
or what Elizabeth had prophesied. I think she understood very well what those things meant, but I think what she was trying to do was to grasp or take in the fact that these things were really taking place and what these things really meant. The Lord was fulfilling His promise to save them, and she rejoiced in God, her Savior, which reminds us that Mary was not immaculately conceived. She needed a Savior as well, and when she knew that she was bearing the Savior and He was born, she rejoiced in His birth because that meant she would be saved. And, you know, I think we can probably, you know, understand, sympathize somewhat with, with Mary. Sometimes everything the Lord does is really too much to take in. It's, it's, it's hard to grasp. You know, we believe what the Bible says, but we struggle sometimes to understand the magnitude of this truth. I mean, we really were in danger of a fiery pit that basically burns forever, and that's where we would have gone. But God really sent His Son into the world to save us from that danger. Remember that hymn we sing by, I think it's Robert Murray McShane. It talks about how he's really not going to know how much he owes the Lord until he sees that lake of fire and he sees the people who are going to be put in there and the, the terror in their eyes as they're about to be cast in. He says, not till then will I know how much I really owe you. But when we trusted the Lord, we were saved from that awful place. Sometimes it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand or to grasp that we have an eternity to look forward to. In heaven, which we don't really fully understand what it means to be a disembodied spirit in heaven, or to be in the new heavens and the new earth in a new world which is perfect and has no sin and no corruption in it. Uh, sometimes, again, we struggle to grasp these things, but the Lord allows us to see something of it, again, by His grace, by His Spirit, and through His Word. And so as we think about all that the Lord has actually done uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ for us, we also need to ask this question, how should we respond? Well, I think if we did what these shepherds did, that would be a good starting place. Verse 20, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as had been told them. As the shepherds, we should praise the Lord. We should give Him the credit, give Him the honor, give Him the glory because He is the one who has done these things. And we should praise Him for all that He has done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, we should share that message with other people. The Lord would have us to give our lives to Him in worship, not only when we meet together on the Lord's Day, but every day with our whole lives. So may the Lord give us the grace uh, to do just that. Let, let's, let's bow for, uh, for a moment of prayer, shall we, that the Lord would apply this, and then I'll, I'll close our time in prayer.